Hello and welcome to the Zechariah Adil podcast. Thank you for joining me again. I really appreciate it. If you like my content, please like and subscribe and click on the little uh, notification bell and you will be alerted when I re release uh, another video. It will be wonderful if you can join me. And uh, as you have today, and our guest today is the wonderful, the fabulous <laughs> Richard Grannon, who's here to discuss with me Religion, spirituality, and the esoteric. Hello, Richard. Thank you for joining me again. Hello, Zach. It's nice to be back, mate. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Um, okay, Richard, what do you think about religion, spirituality, and the esoteric? Wowie. Um, it's a really I bad think? question. It's a terrible question. <laughs> That's a terrible? very broad question. What do exactly. I think about? Um, I, I have a suspicion that um, the times that we're living in and the state that we can see the world in, I have a suspicion that we're here because of our modern abhorrence of religion and spirituality and the esoteric, and that our cure will come from religion, spirituality, and the esoteric. Mm. Interesting. Do, first of all, do you think they're one and the same thing? Religion, spirituality. Um, I, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I'm pretty good with words, but I am actually not sure what the etymological root of esoteric means. I don't really know what that means. I did look it up, but I didn't print that out. So I can't, I, I don't, I'm not good with, I didn't remember it, unfortunately, but I did print out kind of some, some content yeah. about, about these, these terms. So because, uh, you, know, you, you look at like a term like the occult and that strictly speaking means hidden. But the esoteric, I'm just looking it up now. I'm not. Well, uh, what I got here for the esoteric is, is intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with a specialized knowledge or interest, esoteric philosophical debates. But another word is also arcane, which is a synonym for esoteric. It refers to the mysterious or secret philosophical and religious doctrines and traditions which may be understood by few. The ancient Greek means to go within. I like it. Go within. I like it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and that would make sense to me then. Absolutely. I, I, I would think the esoteric is something that we need because we are now going without. Everything is external and the internal is uh, lost. And we need, we're living fully yang, full yang, 24-7, and we're burning out. We need yin. We must have yin. Um, social media doesn't reward yin because act there's no well there isn't really an act of yin there's nothing you can do that you can get likes or follows for that would be yin a fucking half an hour long video of you meditating would be pretty boring and shit and you wouldn't get likes and follows for it so we're not living in a yin rewarding time um, so yeah I think I think absolutely uh, this is a time where we do need religion spirituality and esoteric in the purest sense Hmm. So what I did is I sort of uh, took some uh, content from um, uh, online dictionaries and Wikipedia uh, for what it's worth. So religion here, it says the belief, the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods, a particular system of faith and worship, a pursuit or interest followed with great devotion. Is that your understanding of religion? Yeah, I, I definitely. I think religion has to have, for me, for me to, for it to be religion, I would understand it that way. Yes, there needs to be higher force, and there needs to be some sort of uh, practice or discipline that follows in the fact of that higher force. If we don't have religion, we'll do what Nietzsche predicted we would do when he said, "Lamented, God is dead." which is we'll take the place of God, we'll take the place of the gods, of the goddesses, and we'll put ourselves in the place where they used to be to justify our killing of the gods, the goddesses, and the religion. And that's really the state of the world that we're in. I do not believe we can put the toothpaste back in the tube. I'm not a neo-conservative. I don't think we should try and go back to you know, 15th century Christianity or Islam, try and recreate the Alhambra in Spain and, you know, all hold hands. I don't, that's not going to work. Um, but I think we could reasonably, as adults, re repopularize and reintroduce into the culture mystery. The fact that science is limited, humans are limited. We really don't have all the answers. In fact, we have very few mm -hmm. answers. So we have a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle 
and then we ego wank and tell ourselves that we know everything and we have just this little well piece. you know what that's that's precisely why i i am constantly constantly surprised by people's um by people's confidence in what they what they say and what they do because i i'm all i'm of the mind that we there's so there's so much we don't know and for somebody to just to have such conviction in their beliefs that they know this is right when i watch the tv especially uk tv as well but especially american tv everybody speaks with such like they know they really know what they're talking about so they can talk like that whereas i'm always quite hesitant because the more i and i and i read a fair bit um and, and the more I learn, the more I realize that you, you just don't know much because as soon as you sort of zoom in and there's more to see, then you zoom in again, there's more to see this. So therefore that's, that's going to be, be forever ongoing. So I just don't have that much force behind what I, what I say, because I, I'm, there's a massive part of me that knows that whatever I say, there's still so much more that I don't know. Yeah. Therefore I, I kind of head, I don't want to say hedge my bets. That's not quite the right word. But I'm, I, I just don't speak with the confidence that I know everything. Whereas when other people do, I'm, I'm part, partly in awe and partly like, this is a very arrogant thing to do. It's, um, yeah, I, 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 I appreciate the awe part of it. There's, there's something wonderfully admirable about that level of bigoted stupidity <laughs> and, uh, and arrogant. I, I, I wish I had more of it. Uh, I, when I listen to bigots on any subject, I think, God, it must be so lovely to live in such certainty you like you live in a world where you think i have all the answers and if only people would listen to me the world would be saved and i would sleep like a baby if, mm. uh, if that were the case i i don't sleep like a baby because I, I i just i can't match it it's almost um a lethal dose of certainty really that we've been taking slowly uh, for decades perhaps now centuries if you if you include well, see, see, the thing is, even the most diehard, dogmatic religious leaders, <clears throat> including people who committed terrible, terrible acts of violence, still had to say that they were not God. They still had to submit to a prophet, to a leader, and to a higher force. The worst of the worst. Um, nowadays, that's not the case. You can say, <clears throat> as a doctor, as a scientist, I am the last word on this and science backs me and it's the most dreadful act of hypocrisy and deceit because they know perfectly well that science is not an exact science. I don't know why we're all worshiping at the altar of science. You just take, take an hour to just study the, the problems with science. Listen to scientists telling you why you shouldn't believe every paper that comes out. There was a meta-analysis, it's on YouTube, uh, there was a meta-analysis of all scientific papers done. And when the meta-analysis was completed, they found that 55% of every, sing every single published paper had major flaws in its assumptions, even after it was peer-reviewed and published. Major flaws. So, so yeah, I, I, I would like to see less certainty and, and more humility, more, more openness. Yeah, but maybe it doesn't make for good TV. It makes it a good drama, maybe it makes good for good drama, but it doesn't make for good news or kind of... It, uh... No, it's, it, it's terrible news. And, you know, at some point, we're going to have to reinvite the adults back into the room and start behaving responsibly because when we have uh, media, mainstream media and social media in lockstep, only rewarding trolls, like look at what's going on in America now. Um, look at this whole thing with the sickness that's gone round. Um, you cannot, no sane person on either side of the political divide is claiming that the media has acted responsibly and there's no reward for them to act responsibly. There's no point in them acting. So, so you end up in an environment where if you're not willing to troll, you will be ignored. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, gosh the last week or so everything that's happened it's 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 crazy actually one of the things i was going to do when we come to so once we've sort of gone through the thing the, the structure i've created at the mm -hmm. bottom is related to current events because it's 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 very relevant it's very mm -hmm. relevant i feel like we've lost our connection to uh to godliness to 
whatever our connection to the higher power is, however you choose to define it, whether it's religious, spiritual, esoteric, uh, personal connection, however you want to describe it, I really feel that, you know what, it might not be true. It might not be true that we have lost our connection, but what I see on TV, the image that we're given, the events that are taking place, makes makes me question how connected we still are. You know what I mean? All, all, all indications are, if you look at the outward performative displays of insanity that we're seeing on the TV and the statistics regarding mental health, divorce, and so on and so forth, I think the, we can say with not too much certainty, but just enough, um, that the indicators are that we've, we've certainly lost that connection. Nobody even knows what connection is. Or well, very few people knows what. So if you're involved in, like you were raised in a religious upbringing, so was I. You broke from your religious upbringing and, and turned to alternative views of spirituality. So did I. So we know, we know what connectedness is because we were yeah. forced into false connection well, and then we had to find I, a different one. I never lost my connection. I just mm-hmm. realized that some of this information, I mean, I don't know whether it's right or whether it's wrong. It just didn't resonate with me. A lot of the mm-hmm. stuff that I was being given didn't resonate with me. And I think I tried to make myself fit into that box for a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's only, it's only when I, I wrote a play in 2008 called, uh, originally it was called Masks, and then I changed it to Religion of Love, um, which is a roomy quote. Um, and I, at the beginning of that, I was more sort of Islamically oriented. But by the end of that whole process of writing and performing this play, it was... I just wasn't in the same place anymore. And, uh, and I just had to, I had to, I had to change, I had to shift things around consciously. Whereas before I could kind of sit with my un- a discomfort and just sort of let it be like, okay, I'm a little bit of this, I'm a little bit of this is fragmented. I'm not sure about this or whatever, but I didn't sort of analyze it. Didn't sit there and analyze it. But when I was writing a play about homosexuality and Islam, as I did that, I had to really get into the nitty gritty. And by the end of it, completely un- without choosing to, I was in a different space afterwards. Yeah. I, I don't see. I'm reluctant to say that I wasn't a Muslim anymore because I just that's not true. I still pray Islamically. I still I still know my duas. I still know my you know my my salat. I don't do it five times a day, but I you know sometimes if I can't sleep or something something bad happens, I will pray the Islamic way. So I again I I don't denounce it because it's a really it's a fast way for me to reconnect with God. Uh, and and, it, and it, it works and I feel super super connected but I don't do it as often as I used to because my connection is there anyway mm-hmm. because I, I, I feel very very connected to the higher power source energy whatever you want to call it God but if I need a fast powerful connection I will go back to the Islamic way of doing it because it works for me and I know it you know what I mean yeah. What, what, yeah. do you do that do you do that uh What's your process when you need a, a fast track connection to God? Uh, there's not, there's not often, oh, there's a whole, there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole thing there in my head. Um, but uh, the protocol would be the same as a, as a Christian protocol. Yes. Ultimately, ultimately it would be because in, uh, that was my childhood. So yeah. that's the first place. Which is why when I'm coaching people, you know, I invite them to go back to what their religion was in childhood and find something there to get to get back through to. It seems to be a fast track. Okay. Okay, so, right, just continuing on from, from uh, where we started, I'm going to quickly read out the definition of spirituality uh, mm-hmm. and then the esoteric, and then we'll go from there. So spirituality, I have the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. The shift in priorities allows us to embrace our spirituality in a more profound way. It's an example of how to use the term. Right, so uh, traditionally, tr- uh, spirituality referred to a religious process of reformation, which aims to recover the original shape of man oriented at the image of God, as exemplified by the founders and sacred texts of the religions of the world. The term was used within early Christianity to refer to a life or oriented toward the Holy Spirit and broadened during the late Middle Ages to include mental aspects of life. 
Yeah. In modern times, oh, there's more. In modern times, the term both spread to other religious traditions and broadened to refer to a wider range of experience, including a range of esoteric traditions and religious traditions. Modern usages tend to refer to a subjective experience of a sacred dimension and the deepest values and meanings by which people live, often in a context separate from organized religious institutions, such as a belief in the supernatural beyond the known and observable realm, personal growth, a quest for the ultimate or sacred meaning, religious experience, or an encounter with one's own inner dimension. Mm -hmm. What say mm -hmm. you? Does that resonate? Uh, to, yeah, it's a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good definition. It seems to be um, broadly that the definition of spirituality uh, is that which is not material, is that which is beyond the material world. Um, and so, yes, it makes sense to me. Um, we are living in times where perhaps it would make sense for us to turn away from the material a little bit um, to go internal to find that connectedness that we were talking about before and to be more focused on spirit and less on the material world for sure what do you think is the difference between religion and spirituality um well spirituality i think the implication is doesn't have dogma doesn't have rules doesn't have hypocrisy is more like the mystical experience. It's something that you do subjectively. Um, that's what it should mean. Um, whereas religion would be that which can be observed and can be performed objectively. So you could be a devout Catholic, seemingly. You could do the religion of Catholicism whilst being a serial killing rapist internally. Um, you couldn't do that with spirituality. You couldn't. So you could outwardly look like a drunk or a drug addict or a hermit or something or a homeless person, but be internally, you could be living a completely full and rich spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we come to the esoteric. So I, I kind of mentioned that already, the intended or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with a specialized knowledge or interest. Mm -hmm. So... The, the thing about the esoteric is that it could be, it's a term that could be applied to so many things. Specifically, when it comes to me and my usage, I'm using it mostly for uh, astrology, tarot, those types of, the occultish side, side of things, magic, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, but, it, but it can be, it's a term that can be used broadly to lots of specialized niches, I guess. Um, all right, so... The occult is a term, so, uh, the term occult sciences was used in the 16th century to refer to astrology, alchemy, and natural magic. I have here. I won't read the rest of it, it's quite long. All right, so can we move on to the questions? Can I get to the questions? Sure. Cool. Right, so how useful, how useful or practical are these in today's world? Or which do you feel is the most practical and useful? I think that's that question points to the key issue it, which is that we live in times where everything is reduced to practicality and usefulness um probably because of uh, the fact that we live inside of consumer capitalism and it's very hard for us to imagine a world that isn't governed ultimately by the almighty dollar so one must be useful and practical whereas the sufis would teach us don't bother your ass you know just <laughs> Be useless um, because useful people get used. Uh, so there wouldn't there's a there's a trap here, and many people fall into it. Millions, millions, and people of people fall into it every day all over the world of spiritual capitalism. So you acquire, you know, sort of levels of initiation. You're somewhat more spiritual than your friends. Are you vegan yet? No, you're not vegan. So. Mm -hmm. Are you doing this practice? Are you doing... And then the, it, the capitalism comes in via the back door, um, who were misses, because um, you're acquiring something that you can use to lord over other people that raises you up a, a dominance hierarchy. So yeah, I would, I would say we need, we need to throw it out and say there is no use in this. It's not practical, but if you don't want to be miserable and you want to live a more joyful fuller life you might need more of this in your life and less garbage then it is useful 
because it has a it, it's used is useful in that context on a personal yeah. satisfaction level or uh, living a life that has more meaning sure so i suppose it has that level of usefulness but the practicalness practicality maybe is a different thing sure okay um so what is prayer richard grannon what is prayer well prayer typically we think of it as being you know a, a list of requests for god like uh, writing a, a list for santa claus for what we hope we're going to get for christmas um i remember when i was in my teens uh it was christian mysticism i think that might have come from rosicrucianism that said the more important side of prayer is is rather is listening rather than speaking um prayer can also be the quiet and meditative setting of an intent um it's maybe not telling it's asking maybe it's not even telling or asking maybe it's listening it's an altered state of consciousness in which we think about the things that challenge us the things that frighten us and perhaps the things that we want um so yeah it's, it's somewhere maybe it's like meditation's more active cousin <laughs> i like that a concentration of thought is what i thought which what i wrote down in question mark concentration of thought yeah. yeah what about the role of rituals i think um Anybody who really understands the importance of activating the unconscious and offering the unconscious um, commands, because ultimately it's your, if you do something consciously, but your unconscious isn't down for it, it won't happen. The, the fastest way to access the unconscious is probably going to be through rituals that are highly symbolic because symbols are the language of the unconscious. The unconscious understands that straight away. Rituals connect us to a more primitive and more primal part of our minds and of our brains. The first religions of the world were fetishist religions where objects and rituals and ceremonies were imbued psychologically with power, uh, with emotional force. And um, it's not a bad idea to use rituals, but they are primitive, they are primal. So use them very carefully, very, very carefully. And very sparingly is what I'd say. Do, do, the, do the minimum of them because you really are activating extremely powerful unconscious forces uh, through ritual. So what kind of, what kind of rituals are you, are you speaking about? I mean, because, yeah, what kind of rituals? I mean, are we talking magical rituals here or just religious rituals? All, all, like all rituals are magic. There's no, there's no such thing as, in the context we're speaking of religion and spirituality, uh -huh. Um, obviously, well, no, perhaps not. I mean, if a footballer has a ritual before he goes on the field or a surgeon has a ritual before he does surgery, it's probably all magic. It probably all comes from the child in us that believes in magic. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that. All, all, all rituals are magical in both senses. One in that they engage in primal, pre-conscious magical thinking where we think, we imagine that we're in control of the world you know, if, if as a child, you might have thought of something like, if I can run to the fence on time and jump over it in one go, my mum won't die or something like that. That would be an example of primitive magical thinking. So all rituals, you know, name the religion, um, name the ceremony, like a wedding ceremony is a magical ritual. So it's magical in the psychological sense of magical thinking. And it's magical in the broader sense of setting your intent for a thing to be so, and then making it so. All wedding ceremonies are fundamentally, and always have been and always will be, magical rituals that bind two human beings and two human lives and two human destinies together. They're always magical. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any rituals that you do, like daily or weekly or anything? Very, very, very rarely. There's, there's a ritual I'm engaging in at the moment where before bed, because I'm working from home, because like all of us, and I occasionally go to the office, I'm working online all the time. Um, before bed, I'll do a 15 minute meditation. And it has some ritual elements. To, that's like a little ritual that I go through so I can sleep. Um, but other than that, I, I, I'm very cautious with rituals because I used to fuck with them a lot. And they really are powerful especially if they're repeated and a lot of emotional energy is, is poured into them. 
and they're not always powerful in the way that you want them to be. You'll get a result, but it might not be the result you want. Mm. Well, actually, so because you've said that, I won't go to the next question. What about law, law of attraction? I mean, that's going to come a bit further down, but in my in my list of questions, but the, the, the power of, of, of emotion behind your behind your thought is is how the law of attraction supposedly works, right? Say that again, sorry, mate. The power of emotion behind mm. your thought, like your visualization or your um, or, or your affirmation, it, it, the, what makes it work is the power of the emotion that fuels it, which is similar to what you just said, you no, know, like a ritual. Are you saying that that's what the people who sell the law of attraction say, or are you saying that's well, what the law of attraction? I, I is? guess what I'm saying is, 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 I guess the question is, is it the same thing? The law of attraction is an umbrella term for multiple marketing campaigns and multiple public speakers and, and book writers um systems so there's there's different laws of attraction not many i think there's like five or six well there's a huge number of smaller people on that bandwagon um but the law of attraction is uh, a gross oversimplification and bastardization of authentic um spiritual principles and it's pure capitalism law of attraction is is fundamentally reduces magic and spirituality to you want something you think of it and it shows up and i've always said the only place where that happens is ebay and amazon there's no there's no other <laughs> you know there's no other place where that that happens um so i i, I think the law of attraction i've never heard a a, a a description by anybody of a law of attraction that i didn't think was nonsense just just absolute gibberish and what they promise people is something for nothing you come and you come and you want to do magic and you want to do religion and you'll be told this fucking hurts and it takes ages and it might not work whereas the law of attraction says just think about it and you can have whatever you want no you can't that's a lie and it's not going to happen <laughs> i suppose that's that's the secrets that's the way the secret was marketed wasn't it the uh, the, 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 the secret was the most beautiful, beautifully ex ex executed exercise in magic. Um, but it was not magic with intent to uplift the consumers. It was a group of public speakers and marketers coming together. People think it was, um, her name is Rhonda Byrne. She was, the, she was the student of a guy called Dr. Joe Vitale. I studied Joe Vitale before The Secret came out because he was a copywriting and sales and marketing expert, not a spiritual teacher. And uh, he, he gave us, uh, if you paid him, the blueprint for what The Secret was in 2002. And people still use it to this day. If you want to make a ton of money, you say if you wanted to do astrology and you wanted to make a ton of money, you would, you would speak to 20 astrologers online You'd say, I'm going to make a documentary series. We'd like to interview you for it. And the interviews that they give you for free through which you market their products. They'll, that, so it's like this, uh, a circle jerk. It's a marketing circle jerk. So the secret really is magic, just not for us. It's magic for, for the people who made millions, millions. Because it, for the day, it's dated now. If you watch it now, it looks like shit. But at the time in 2006, when it came out, it was beautifully crafted. It was a, it was a, the perfect, it was pre financial crash, peak capitalism, um, the perfect banal message. It had zero content. There was no content <laughs> to the secret whatsoever. Um, so it was, it was, it alludes to magical principles, but there's no, there's zero, zero magic in that at all. Hmm. What about, have you heard, I think I mentioned to her to you last time, Esther Hicks, the one who, who channels Abraham. Have you heard of her? Mm -hmm. Because she was originally on The Secret and then um, they tried to take her, the, they needed, the, they, Rhonda Byrne needed Esther to sign over the copyright to all the Abraham work, which they'd been doing since 85. Yeah. And uh, Esther and Jerry said no. And yeah. that's, then she was removed from the original Secret. And they yeah. have to remove some of the content as well. Because I find, I find, I think there is something to it. I think there is something to the law of attraction and it can be used. I definitely think that there's, that there's something to it. In fact, uh, I'm quite into it big time. But specifically, uh, by the way, I have Joe Vitale stuff as well. I've got, got some of these things here. He's um, great. If you want to learn is, how to make money, he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. But uh, Esther Hicks, if you want to learn about the law of attraction, I would go to Esther Hicks. I think she's, she's brilliant. 
uh, in the way that she breaks it down. Well, let's 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 walk up this pathway for a second. Then, what what is the law of attraction according to Esther Hicks? Um, I guess Esther Hicks would say that our that our our mind and our body is like a receiving. Is 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 a wait? Hold on, no, hold on. How do, how do I explain it? She would say that that which you focus on, where you put your where you put your energy. Uh, is what you're going to create into your, into your experience. You're going to attract it into your experience. So if you're focused on the, uh, what, what you want, then you're, you're going to activate the reticular activation system. So you're going to see the things in the world out there that's going to draw the thing to you. So, um, so then you're giving signals to your subconscious to point out the things that are going to get these things into your experience. Uh, um, do you, do you like, obviously you've got your own idea of law of attraction. Do you think that matches pretty much with your idea of what law of attraction is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's the person I've learned it from mostly. So, would that mean by that logic, if you focused on something and gave it your energy, it would show up in your life? Yeah, and maybe not immediately, but it also depends on how much time and energy okay. that you that you and maybe and maybe not immediately. So when. It doesn't show up in your life, and I don't even need to ask you because <laughs> I know it hasn't. How do you how do you rationalize that? Like you're focusing on something, it's not showing up. Does Esther tell you try harder, give it another year, or what does she say? Well, oh, I don't know, Richard, man. What would she say? <laughs> she'd say she'd say something along the lines. I am of, I am the de I am the destroyer of dreams. But listen, <laughs> listen. There's, there is something really to this, but, but it's the law of attraction is, well, the, the reason the, it's, it's a total bastardization well, well, in well, magic. And listen, listen, listen to me. There is no such thing in magic as something for nothing. Never has been, never will be. Mm -hmm. Energy is not created from nothing. It's a hermetic principle. Hermes Thoth gave us that in the early days of magic. So unless you sacrifice something, you will be given nothing. And people who are watching this going, fucking Ellie's talking about child sacrifice. No, no, no. The sacrifice would be time, attention, yeah, yeah. effort, suffering, and sweat. Well, Napoleon Esther Hill Hicks, said that in his, in his book. Esther Hicks and everybody who came after her is promising you something for nothing, which is why the things that you focused on haven't shown up in your life because she's giving you half a message. She's mm -hmm. giving you a half truth. I, I think the law of attraction has, it, it's, it, it came, well, it is from magic, but it's predominantly from the New Thought movement. It's an American creation, but even the New Thought movement was more honest than the law of attraction. The New Thought movement was jump up and down like a Baptist preacher and declare repeatedly, like somebody who's lost their mind, I will be wealthy, I will do this, and then you have the Napoleon Hill stuff. Yeah, You've yeah. got to write it down every day. You've got to commit yeah. massive action to it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's Anthony, Anthony Robbins is the best modern permutation of the new thought movement. Sitting around with your finger up your nose is not going to get you. <laughs> but she, she doesn't say that. She says take inspired action. The thing about Esther Hicks, and she, what she would say is that if, you, if you're consciously trying to do this thing, but your unconscious is not in alignment with what you want consciously, it's not mm. going to happen because you've got split energy. So if you're... So if how, you're does she teach you, how does she teach you to align your unconscious then? Because she's defined a clear block to the manifestation of your intent. Yeah. What is her system to eradicate on? Well, there's a book she's released called Ask and, uh, Ask and It Is Given. And in this mm -hmm. book, there are, there's like, I can't remember how many, but this, I think there's about 30 different processes that you can use uh, to sort of begin to activate, put your, put your system in alignment with what you want. So uh, one of the things she teaches is a focus wheel. Do a, do a focus wheel, have a wheel, split it into 12 sections, and then write uh, affirmative things all the way around this wheel that um that get you get you on board with the with the thing that you want to create um yeah. and i found it i found it's definitely helpful for shifting my energy and start i mean i've used it many times and it has worked well okay yes it, it has worked for me i i bought you know i bought properties i bought cars with it so it has worked for me but what i've noticed is that when i'm in a good headspace that's when it tends to work for me. If I sit down there consciously and do it, there's a block, but then I'll do my affirmations and I'll make myself, as soon as I make myself believe it, it's like a click happens. And once that click happens, it, it comes to me.
I'm going to take you away from this path of utter degradation and perversion, and you're going to have a much better time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the thing is, okay, as we are here, one of the issues yeah. I have with it is, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've literally got this down here. I see the value in it. It's helped me in the past to create things in my life. However, I struggle with sticking my head in the sand and question whether it might be better to strike a balance between the two aspects of this, of uh, positive thoughts and high vibration, rather than just not just having the not just sticking your head in the sand but looking at what the issues of, of life are and then doing something about it because yeah. the law of attraction would say don't focus on the things that aren't working in your life focus on what you want to happen and these things will just fall away i struggle yeah. with that because i don't i i feel like you've got to work through these things and i've, I've sort of focused i've had my head in the sand i've tried it that way and it just that hasn't worked if yeah. i look at my development my development has been fast tracked by books like, well, the Adlerian Psychology, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. The, uh, the, I, I read the, the, the recently a book, I read this book, uh, The Courage to Be Disliked, which I thought was brilliant. Um, yeah, sorry, the, the one that you just mentioned though isn't Adler, it's uh, Covey, isn't it? Stephen yeah, R. Covey. Yeah, Covey, but his, his processes were, Stephen R. Covey, but his processes were Adlerian. Adlerian, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I mean, I, that was my, that's my favorite book of all time, The Seven Habits. Um, and but I didn't know at the time that it was Adlerian. I only found out recently when I read The, the Courage to be Disliked that, that Covey's work was Adlerian. I found it yeah, really, no, I mean, people, I, I no idea. People rip Adler off left, right, and center. Include, Anthony Robbins does as well, and they don't credit him um, yeah. because he didn't, he didn't have a definitive flavor. So if you're going to rip off Jung, people will be like, this is fucking Jung. If you rip mm -hmm. off Freud, they'll know. But Adler, because it was, it was very functional. It was very, as you mentioned before, practical, utilitarian, the most. You know, it barely even qualifies as navel gazing psychoanalysis. It's very much new thought, personal development, positive psychology uh, type of thing. But I think the guy he, was a genius. He was yeah, a he genius. was a genius. But the thing is, he couldn't have been that good if he had an ego. So the reason why he, he didn't have he didn't have an e a big ego, like he didn't need to be remembered, didn't need to be not like Freud did or not like these other people did. So therefore, he didn't he didn't need he didn't have the need to pitch himself in any which way. Because actually, if he did that, it would have got in the way of the work. Mm. so uh, that, that that's my that's my sort of uh two pennies worth <laughs> but I don't know, it was it's just very interesting i think adler's work is amazing and it's helped me a lot uh, yeah i've bought loads of books actually i haven't even got got around to them yet because i'm i'm reading um uh pete walker's pete walker's book at the moment the homes homesteading excellent okay but i get i get drawn off uh, off track i'm off track let me come back well, we're, we're in really, really interesting topics and they're, they're important. They're, it's, it's really important uh, topics. One of the things I would say to people who have CPTSD, the, the law of attraction is, is half of a story. And the problem with it is most people with CPTSD have a tendency to dissociate. And it, it leads you. It can lead you into dissociation. It can lead you into its own spiral because it has a circular logic you know, where at the end you're like, well, focus on the thing that you want. Is it really the thing that you want? It didn't show up for me. Are you aligned with the thing that you want? And it's, it becomes sophistry. Uh, sophistry is where you're just speaking very cleverly about a philosophical subject, but you're not actually really saying anything. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they would tell you the other half of the story, which is focus on what you want and then work really fucking hard for it. Mm -hmm. That's also magic. The people who run this world understand that. Well, so you know what Esther Hicks would say is that she she never says you shouldn't do anything. Just sit there and wait for mm. it to happen. That was the secret. That wasn't Esther Hicks. Mm. Esther mm. Hicks would say, get yourself in alignment. Get yourself into the vortex. She would say, mm. once you're in that vortex, take inspired action. Because then, when you get inspiration, then then you take action. No, that is, you God know, you have mercy on me. God have mercy it. on me. <laughs> Fucking Americans, <laughs> and they're just me Americans. All of you, listen to me. Stop making up words. What, what, what does getting into the vortex mean? Well, this is her, her terminology, isn't it? Basically, she, right. she talks about how there's a, there's a vortex uh, of energy. Um, yeah. And once, you're in that, once you raise your vibration to a certain level, you will enter the vortex. And once you're in the vortex, it, all the things that you want to experience are in that vortex waiting for you. This sounds artfully vague. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how would one know one was in one's vortex? That you basically, you change your state to the point where you feel good yeah. and then then when you're feeling good, then you take action. Is that, then is that the idea? Then you take action because then you're going to get more inspired uh, um, thoughts. Okay. That's, that sounds significantly better than, than uh, the worst elements of the secret. Just that one yeah. thing. 
yeah. that you would actually access that she's actually saying alter your state which is hugely important and earlier you said that she was did you say that she she advised you to have a pie with 12 slices and you think uh, about you, the thing that you want and you try and figure out what the blocks are no 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 in that in that thing what you say you say affirmative things so you can basically what you want to do is you want to get into that vortex and how you get into that vortex is you this is one of the processes in that book the, the focus wheel so in this you know what, i think i've got one here actually do you want to see it yeah, let's have a look. Let's, let's, let's show the people at home. Don't rip it apart, though, Richard. I'm a horrible man. Okay, I'm back. So this is quite exposing for me because um, I, 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 I was trained as an actor when I was younger and then I worked for a little while and then I did a sketch show for Channel 4 called, well, no, we're going to what it's called. Um, tell and, me. No, no, I'll, t I'll tell you off, off the figgy. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, was, I was cast in this sketch show for Channel 4. And, what, what, uh, what year was this? Was I in the country then? What year were you doing 2007. it? 2007. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably saw it. Go on. So, yeah, you, you might have done. Um, and I was cast as the lead uh, and uh, with, a, with a bunch of uh, uh, stand-up comics. And uh, some of them have gone on to, to big careers now, actually. But what happened is I had a terrible experience with the director. And uh, I was ill-prepared as well, I've got to say. So it just, it just destroyed my confidence. So I told my agent... Did you, did you, did you know... Uh, you'd never done anything on that scale before you weren't too sure that was, what to experience. I've been working hard getting myself to that to that point and I got right. to that point and then I just I, I just lost my confidence and I uh, my I told my agent just I, I'm not sure if I want you to put me up for anything for a while um, right. and so I took a break and then I tried to get back into it and I, I just my confidence never really never really but it sounds like it traumatized you it sounds like it, the experience was so bad that it actually wounded you yeah it was really bad it was really bad. But now that I know about the uh, narcissism dynamics and the CPTSD, I realized I was completely and utterly triggered by this guy who was yeah. a bit like one of my family members who, who okay. yeah. So I completely, now I have an understanding of what happened. At the time, I just felt, because what happened is when we were actually on set and we were doing things, he, he, would, he would say, the producers would be stood there and he would say something like, oh, don't say that to him. You'll, you'll get him started. Don't, don't get him started sort of thing. And I was like, what the fuck do you mean? Why, what, what, what do you mean by that? And mm. it was just, it, it, sometimes it mostly was indirectly comments to cut me down, but sometimes they mm. were, became, they became quite direct. So my confidence mm. as an actor completely went down the toilet. So this I'm is sorry my, to hear that, mate. Oh, that's all right. So here, this is like my makeshift version of a focus. Well, I think I've got an actual one here, which is printed out. This is my, own makeshift one okay here it is so this is the focus wheel right um so determine what i or, i already like the fact that this woman is asking you to write stuff down i'm already warmer than i was okay she i think it really amazing. helps it, this ritual of writing stuff down yeah. is magical and it, it really helps so this is, this is the process. So determine what you don't want. Based on what you don't want, determine what you do want. Write, in the center of the, write it in the center of the wheel. Imagine the wheel as if it's spinning at the vibration of your desire. Think of a statement about the desire. Find statements that feel less resistant until one resonates with your desire. Write that statement at the 12 o'clock position. Ride that wave and continue writing statements in, in the remaining sections. Write a statement from where you are now vibrationally in, in the outer middle circle. Can I, can, I, can I just say something here? I like that. that that's not law of attraction. No. <laughs> that's, that, well, that's psychology. She's, what she's teaching you to do is to, uh, through the back door, she's asking you to become not more emotionally literate, but more desire literate. So you're, you're being given an opportunity to redefine your desire, yeah. to redefine what you don't want, and then to have sort of like um, 
a micro level think and a sort of a, what are you what are you putting the different sections with the different sections for different okay so now i'm going to come to the, the version that i wrote okay my, oh, yeah, let's, my let's have a little so, look at that so i what i put in the middle of the of the circle was i want to be confident about my abilities as an actor okay, okay. so um <laughs> okay so this is what i wrote did you do this after the experience or before this is i did this in like 2008 or 2009 something like that so two years later yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah maybe something like that around that it's, a, time. it's, a, it's a, it is it is important it's important so two, two okay. years later okay Go. something like that it may have been even 2010 but okay. i did my own plays around 2008 2009 uh Go. and then so maybe it was a bit after that because I was still acting until about 2010. So probably around that time. Okay, so this is what I wrote. This is the first one I wrote. So you want to write them down. So the, the first one you write down might not be as powerful as the last one. The last one should be the most powerful one because ah, as, you're, so as you're going along, it's against, power you're raising you your vibration. Up. Exactly. The whole thing is to get your, raise your vibration into that vortex. Vortex of like creation. It. Right? Okay. okay. So here you go. And this is just one process. She's got loads of them in that book. Right, so you are generally a nice person to have around. So that is an added bonus when you are booked for a job. So, uh, sorry, this is, is that the you... first one. That's not the first one. Sorry, this is the first one. This is the first one here. You have done two. Context, though, Zach. What okay. What are these? These These are. You know what it is. Um, so your statement in the middle was, "I want to be confident that I'm a better actor." Your first few statements. Then, are you telling you how you can know that you're a good actor? No. What you're doing is you're you're telling you you're, you're writing you're telling yourself. Um, true statements they have to be true you have to believe it otherwise there's no point in writing it down can't be Lovely. a lie I love, I love that right? i love that because if it's a lie it's not going to resonate with who you are it's pointless yep. writing it down so no, this is good so and, and then what you do is as you go around what you find is you be, you begin to you develop momentum you get momentum and then all of a sudden as you say this one thing which is true then it leads to another thing that is true to another thing that's true and then by the end of it you you you, you can almost say with certainty i'm i am a confident actor okay i, I know i can i know i can act can you give us like four of the statements so we can see the sort of the scaling up of, sure, of the of sure. confidence? So you've done a two, you've done two years training um, at this theater. You notice a huge improvement in your abilities from when you started to, to the finish of the course. So that's mm. already, uh, okay, that's true, it's fact. Mm. When you did that rehearsed reading at, at RADA, you were the best actor there, everybody knew it. <laughs> um, when you were training- You were, the, be you were the best actor at RADA and everybody actor. knew it? In, for the rehearsed reading, not at RADA, the, the, not at the training school. Uh, there was a rehearsed reading. I was I was paid to do a rehearsed reading, and when okay. we turned up, when we turned up, I, um, the, yeah, this is very exposing for me. But I'm going to say anyway You're because good, I'm trying to give an example. This has become right. therapy now. <laughs> <laughs> when you were training at Pinewood, the other actors kind of looked up at you, up to you, and recognized your talent and intelligence and humor. Wonderful. Okay, so the next one was, you are generally a nice person to have around, so that is an added bonus when you are booked for a job. You do know how to prepare, this next one is, you do know how to prepare for an actor's job, but sometimes you do not do it. When you have, this is a play I did, for your performance, it was very good. Also, when you did that first showcase, eh, I don't know what I've written there. Oh, let's leave that one. You are so, at so your... Sorry, mate, there's, 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 a, there's a couple of things here. I can, I can see where this is going. I really like this. It's actually, it's doing two very, very powerful things at the psychological level. It's reinforcing positive beliefs that you otherwise weren't looking at when you're in your catastrophic thinking and going, I fucking suck as an actor. And then you write it down and you go, no, no, I act. So it's belief work. Great. It's also asking you to exercise your executive function, which is a hard concept from psychology, but it's basically the part of you that gets stuff done. You don't always get stuff done, but the part of you that actually can take control, it's an exercise in that. So I would say this exercise that you've shown me, um, this is good psychology. This is, yeah. and so Esther Hicks, I'll, I'll, I'll be like Esther Hicks. Okay. I know a little bit more well, about that. On an astrological level, as Esther Hicks and Tony Robbins are the exact same chart. They're, they're rat with Pisces, Chinese year of the rat and they're Pisces. So uh, they have this similar outcome, different, yeah. different processes. I know that this isn't, we're supposed to be talking about magic, but there is magic here. Um, for me, if magic doesn't encompass trauma, it's not real magic. It's not real spirituality. One of the things that this process doesn't account for, and a lot of intent setting and uh, manifestation of desire, creative visualization doesn't account for, is trauma. If you are traumatized on an issue, that trauma must be healed first 
or the unconscious won't let you go there. I suspect that you have downplayed how very, very upsetting you found the 2000. It was really, it was, it was, it was really bad. It was really bad. At one point I had to go into a trailer and just, I was catatonic. At one point I was catatonic. Um, So so you've, you've got, I would say to 2009, you who wrote that, this is all good, but your unconscious is predominantly focused on keeping you safe and you do not feel safe. Mm -hmm. You don't. So we would have to do like, you've actually got to heal heal trauma uh, for this, for this process to, to work, but that's real magic. That's Mm -hmm. alchemy. Alchemy is taking shit and pain and wounds and poison and turning it into gold and opportunity and thriving. So there's a real process here that you could go through. Uh, If you wanted to get back into acting, I'd be happy off air to work with you on this issue. If you don't want to work with me, I've got coaches who will work with you. Um, I don't want to work with you, Richard. (laughs) Anybody would be happy, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but that um if you if you wanted the the acting thing to be sorted out there's a wound there that just mm-hmm. it just needs resolving i think it just needs resolving and then and then you'll be free you'll be free to to get back into that if you choose to that'd be great thank you okay so we get back on track <laughs> yes let's do it sir let's do it <laughs> all right so i think we've done the law of attraction side of it yeah let's, let's finish that off what about synchronicity what do you think that is Oh, dude, I had a major synchronicity today. I was going to do a video on synchronicity. Um, I had a synchronicity about synchronicity, which is, which is Jung warned us of this. He said, when you think and talk synchronicity, they show up more. Mm-hmm. So I was um, walking along to do, I, I'm on this training protocol where I have to train twice a day and I was walking along, I have to train outside and there was poppies uh, growing beautiful poppies growing up through the concrete there's red brick if people aren't from the uk we build these awful awful bloody houses with red brick so ugly <laughs> and tarmac intersecting and my head was down and i'm listening to some trance music and i'm just like okay warming my brain up for the day and i saw these poppies coming up through the fucking concrete beautiful delicate momentary i mean no human hand can come close to building that. The best we can do is make a painting or take a picture, but we can't make anything. So then I'm spiraling on, we can't make this. We can't make nature. We should have more reverence for the fact that we can't actually fucking create poppies or a wasp or a fly. We've got no chance. It doesn't, doesn't happen. And then I was like, what's the chance of these poppies growing there? How the fuck are they growing there? If I wanted them to grow there, they w- and it's like, well, I guess a bird shat a seed out or the wind blew the seeds there. And then life is so keen to be life. They just took root in a space of dirt and con- and then grew a beautiful flower. And I was like, nah, that's fucking horseshit. That's not nah. that. That means there has to be intent. There has to be God. And then I was like, this is my, when you asked me about God before I have a whole thing that I go through and I'm like, or you can't describe little human, the simulation that you're in. You can't describe the game that you're in. So then I go off on simulation theory. And as I'm walking along, a builder is shouting along to the music. And I'm like, fucking scousers, noisy twat. I pull my (laughs) headphone out. I'm like, I wonder what bullshit music he's singing along to. And he's singing along to Electric Dreams. We'll always be together forever in Electric Dreams, which I first heard that song in the movie. I think the movie's called Electric Dreams, which is about a computer that becomes sentient and falls in love with a beautiful human female. And then I think think people get ingested into the computer at the end of the film or something. I think people actually go into the Matrix. It's like really crap special effects. It's 80s stuff. And so I was like, what the fucking chances? I I haven't seen it. It's, I don't remember it being a great film, but it's an interesting concept given the world we live in now. And I think it's from like 84 or something. It's an it's a early 80s film. I was like, what are the chances of that? I'm, I'm going off on simulation theory. I walk down the street, pull my, pull my plugs out, and there's this dude singing about electric dreams from the film where it's actually the dreamer becomes that which is being dreamed. We've created a dream called computers. This is what simulation theory is. Mm -hmm. is that we've evolved so far in the past that we basically stuck ourselves inside of a simulation. And if you watch Rick and Morty, 
they take it a step further and they go, no, there's a level down and then there's a level down. And, there's, and so we're like six or seven levels down of a dreamer's dream where the dreams that the dreamers have dreamed. And uh, what were you asking me? How the fuck did I go on this? Oh, synchronicity. Synchronicity. Every time I was saying yesterday, every time you get to the edge of the map on a computer game, if you've ever played Call of Duty or something like that, you'll be like, oh, I wonder what's over there. But if the coders didn't put a gun or something over there, there's no reason for you to walk up to that wall. From a distance, it looks like a wall in a warehouse. When you take your dumb character and just walk it at the wall, it just stands there walking at the wall and you look at the pixels, you don't see wall anymore, you see pixels. So synchronicity, I suspect maybe those moments where we touch the pixels at the edges of reality, where you're now at the edge of the game. And there were people previously that I listened to who were saying that if you see a synchronicity, you should follow it or it means you're on the right path. I don't know if it indicates that. It does seem to be in those moments where you're doing something perhaps symbolically that moves you from one boundary to the next in this simulation. Hmm. The god Hermes uh, is the god of boundaries. Uh, Hermes is a prototype for the African Egyptian uh, god Thoth, the god of wisdom, uh, formerly yeah. Djibouti. And Hermes to the, to the Romans and the Greeks was the god of boundaries. Specifically, he was allowed, he, he sets boundaries and he keeps them, which is why we have hermetic sealing. When something is hermetically sealed, it's boundary and you can't break it. But he was also permitted special rights to transcend to heaven and back. He was allowed to fly between the boundaries. So the fact that Hermes is, and Thoth are our forebears in terms of the magical tradition, I think is really, really interesting. It, it, it fascinates me that those are his specific attributes is mm. to be able to transgress the boundaries. And maybe whenever we transgress boundaries, in a certain sense, we're hitting the edge of the simulation and you'll see synchronicities popping off to say, there it is, there it is. Mm. I've actually got a question about, Herm well, the lament of Hermes, uh, the death mm. of the old Egyptian gods. That's th three, three questions down. Um, should we go there now as we're on Hermes? Sure. Let's do it, let's do it. All right, then, death of the old Egyptian gods, the l lament of Hermes. Kind of reminds me of that American Gods TV show. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I have read the book, yep. Yeah, oh, I haven't read the book. I didn't know there was a book. I thought it was just a TV show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no. he's, a, he's, a Brit, he's a British guy uh, who, who, who wrote that. It took him a long time. Fascinating dude. Like, if you listen to interviews with him on YouTube, he's a really smart dude. Neil Gaiman. Yeah, Neil Gaiman. Okay. Well, what was I asking here? Um, so, so in, that, in that TV show, in the American Gods, they need, to, they need the attention to stay alive and relevant, right? So I thought it's kind of like a commentary on narcissistic society that we're living in today. What do, what do you think? Yeah, there's, there's, there's actually a line that's delivered by, oh God, she, which one to play? The girl from X-Files. What's her name? Jill, Gillian Anderson. Gillian Anderson, thank you. Yeah. She becomes Medea, the goddess of media, and she says to Shadow, uh, who's, who's a lad from, who's not far from here, actually, the, 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 the English lad who plays Shadow, she says, um, time and attention, Shadow, sweeter than lamb's blood. I need all the time and attention they have. They sacrifice their time and attention to me, the television and the screen, the mobile phone, whilst ignoring their children and their spouses. It was always time and attention. There was never anything else but time and attention. That's what a ritual is. That's what a ceremony is. You mm -hmm. keep Thoth alive. You keep Hermes alive. You keep Horus alive. There were sacrifices. There were human sacrifices. There were animal sacrifices. And then there's the sacrifice of time and attention is the easiest one to do. So no, it's a, it's a fascinating idea that they, they weaken and grow in strength depending on who is worshiping them. Medea was obviously very, very strong and he invented new gods as well, right? Like technology. And whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was really clever. Yeah. But again, it, this, that whole American gods thing and the lament of Hermes, I thought it's quite interesting because the gods are dying off. Uh, and, and in terms of the American gods, it's like, you need the attention to, to stay relevant. Whereas yeah. in, in the Lament of Hermes, it was just prophecy, wasn't it? That the, the, there will come a time where the Egyptians, the, there will come a time, it will be, have been in vain that Egyptians have honored the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. 
That's it's the it's the lament of Hermes, also known as the prophecy of Thoth. Prophecy of Thoth, yeah. Yeah. So so it was a foresight to the days. Uh, you've got it in front of you, but he says um, the lunatics will be seen as righteous men, and mm -hmm. the righteous men will be seen as lunatics. Good is yeah. bad, night is day. Everything is upside down, and men will completely forget gods. There's a point that you alluded to earlier, and we moved away from. We are in. We are the American gods. Where, so the the instead of having one big god, or maybe you could have like twenty five for all the cultures of the world. Now we have billions of gods. I'm a god. You're a god. And that time and attention is fractured out amongst billions of human beings. Maybe we still we have our celebrities. Maybe like Johnny Depp, Brad Pitt is is a god. They're offered a lot of time and a, and, a, and attention. Um, but we're all fighting now to do that. We're all fighting to acquire as much of people's, this precious, precious resource called mm. time and attention now as possible. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating idea. And um, I do think you can bring gods and goddesses back to life in your world by offering them your time and your attention, and they will gratefully return. What does that mean? They'll, they'll return in what way? How can they return? What do you mean by that? I think, how, how could they impact my life if I did that? I think um, one of the things that really fascinates me on, on that question is, uh, is Egypt, particularly. When I look at the Egyptian gods uh, and ellipse, Egyptian religion, I don't think that they were gods as we know gods. Same with the Romans and the Greeks. I'm very suspicious of the Romans and the Greeks in, in terms of having gods. So we have, you know, you and I, we originally had the one God, the, the God of Abraham, the God of mm -hmm, the Jews, mm -hmm. um, Yahweh, Allah. Uh, that's our God, and he's one. They didn't have that. So he's on high. Well, for, the, for Christians, he's out. He's up in heaven. For Muslims, he is everything is here ever present for the romans and the greeks and the egyptians the way that they just swap their gods around um there's a theory uh, that for my name uh, granin nobody really knows where it comes from but one theory is that it comes from worshippers of a cheeky waterfall god called granis who would chase after the women uh, when they bathed in the waterfalls <laughs> he was like a mini god but he was a blend. Uh, he was a Roman Celtic god. So you had Roman and Celtic gods who came together. Nobody's doing that naively. Nobody's, the Romans weren't talking to the Celts and going, um, oh, a new god was born. They must have designed them. So uh, I, I suspect historically, and I, I'm, I even believe, as others do, that the, the Jesus myth is like this. It's not like it is today. Jesus is on high. The book is written, it's over. Now you do as you're told. I think early Christianity was, you, 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 you could write the stories of Jesus. You, you could do a gospel of Zechariah because it wasn't, nobody thought that the gospel of Luke was really a witness account. It was a myth. So it's like Spider-Man. Nobody owns, well, somebody owns Spider-Man, but you and I can write a Spider-Man story tomorrow and then sell it back to... Is it Marvel? Whoever, who doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. He's Marvel. Yeah. He's Marvel. So that archetype we can have access to, as Neil Gaiman does. He understands this because he's a comic book writer first, I think. Graphic novelist for sure. So so you you would have ownership. This babble is to say in Egypt, I'm pretty convinced that there's a whole magical system only understood by the initiated where yes, the gods were gods on high, but they were also mnemonics. They were also reminders. They would be integrated into your psychology. You wouldn't know um, that the voices in your head were you. You may literally think you're talking to Thoth. You may go and do a sacrifice to Horus, and then he would come to you, and naively you would experience his conversation with you, but you would not naively pay the priests. They were paid. They were, they were paid men. So, so I look back and I'm like, yes, it's religion and they were gods, but not as we know them today, where you're to naively believe there is a God and then there's, this, there's the Father, there's the Son and the Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, but he's also a trinity. 
sorry. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's just pushed on us. In those days, I think it was like, you know, do you believe in, say if you and I say we believe in spirituality and we love having talks about spirituality, we would believe in Thoth. We would, be, we would say we're followers of Thoth. So we would meet together, we would do a ritual to Thoth, and then we would talk as we're talking now. We'd say, thank you for this talk, Thoth. And that's how we would offer our sacrifice. Did that, did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a bit similar. It's a bit sim well, is it similar to a ritual thing? So you do something, you invoke the energy of this creature. Yes. Or God or whatever. And yes. then you're speaking to your, you're, you're actually communicating with an aspect of yourself. Some might say you're channeling or maybe there doesn't even need to be a response from the other, the other entity. You're just speaking your side of it, but because you feel like you're being heard and it's yeah. being answered, then you've activated this thing in your life and maybe uh, yes. you're more likely to achieve it. I yes. Yes. There's, so the raw materialist scientific reductionist psychology in me does the same backflip that you, you just did. It's a Jungian black backflip. Um, oh, it, it's me. You know, it's me talking to me. It's the unconscious. At this time when we're speaking now in the middle of 2020, I'm trying to stop doing that. I'm trying to say, no, it's not that. It's actually Thoth. It's actually Thoth. Stop telling yourself it's not Thoth. Stop telling yourself your guardian angel is just an element of your unconscious because that kills it. That mm, kills it. Right. I, was, I, I, had a, I had a vision the other day. I did a meditation and I could see the gods and goddesses of this world warring across the sky. And a part of me went, stop. This is psychosis. Stop it. You'll go crazy. And I went, no, I think I'll just be alive. And I lost it. I lost it because civilization kicks back in. My ego locks it down and goes, no, that's, that's yeah. not happening. And I thought, what a better life it would be if that was happening. The people before our time were alive because the, they didn't have the answers. We're killed by our answers. We're killed by them. They mm. lived in pure potentiality. They were in life. We're not in life. We, we are, life is sort of beneath us. We hover above life and it's miserable. It's a miserable, dank, gray prison where we're, you know, we just consume a bit. You fuck a bit, but not too much. Don't hurt anybody. And it's not, we're not alive. We're not really living. It's, it's pitiful. What, this, this version of civilization we've created we have crushed ourselves with, with safety. So to come back to that question, it would need to be a dang, like, in order for somebody in the modern world to do it, you would need to flirt dangerously with psycho what the psychologists of today would call flirting with psychosis. Otherwise, what is it? Mm. What, you have to break the boundaries. You have to break the mold. You, I think you have to go beyond, go to the end and say, no, this is not, this is not my unconscious. It's thoth. It's a baboon who can write from Egypt. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> he can speak, he can write, and he taught human beings how to write. And his name was Djibouti. And that's it. And I, I think the more we can go there, the more chance of uh, salvation we have because we can break the shackles. That's so interesting because I would imagine there's a lot of psychologists that are, are pulling people the other direction. Get your feet back on the ground, come back to the, come back to the world. Uh, yep. t take a practical uh, find a practical solution that's based in reality and grounded as yeah. opposed to this notion of just letting yourself go with the fairies mm. and just let your faith bring you to this new place where you might you might be given the solutions in your daydream who knows who knows yeah you and i i would all i would say if you if you sincerely do a ritual to a god or a goddess, um, <laughs> I, remember, I remember being in a situation and saying, I'm going to chant to Kali. And Kali's a, quite a vicious yeah, she is. Hindu goddess. And uh, I was like, I wonder if I can escape this situation. I'll chant on this for 25 days. I did three days and it was done. I did three days and it was done. And then my brain goes, it's just a coincidence. Or, you know, the, the fact that you were chanting showed your unconscious that you were psychologically ready to move on. And I'm like, yeah. Or there's an actual morphogenetic field, which is a, 
is a scientific concept. It's controversial, but it's, it seems to be true, which is, um, oh, fuck, he's a British guy. I can't remember his name, who, who came up with morphogenetic fields. But a poppy knows how to be a poppy because there's the template for a poppy in the field. It's mm-hmm. a morphogenetic field. It, it shows up every day as a poppy. It doesn't randomly turn into a sunflower because it's manifesting as poppy. Why is it manifesting as poppy? Any scientists want to tell us why it's manifesting as poppy? And they'll give you some stupid boneheaded answer like, well, it's genetics say it has to be. Yeah, but what are they? What does that mean? I remember asking my uncle who fought in what, uh, uh, he was my great grandfather. He was my, it's, it's a complicated family relationship. He, he'd fought in World War II in the parachute regiment. He killed people in World War II when I was a kid. Mm. And I was like, how did you kill people? And he was like, oh, sometimes if there was an ambush, I never killed anybody directly, but there'd be a group of men and I'd, I'd shoot them with a machine gun. I go, anything else? He'd be like, well, I, I threw grenades into where I knew groups of men were. One of those grenades must have killed people. So I said, explain a grenade to me. And I wanted to know what made a grenade explode. And he gave me all the mechanistic, like the pin and where the gunpowder is and how it blows up and creates shrapnel. I'm like, no, what makes the fucking thing explode? And of course he didn't know. Who knows what makes the fucking thing explode? Well, the hermetic magicians did who invented gunpowder back in the day. They knew, but that's information. So we have to hit a place where we go, we really don't know. We don't have the answer to these questions, not in any satisfying way. So maybe there really is a goddess to all intents and purposes called Kali. And if you chant to her, she'll bite through and smash through and cut through that which is holding you back because she's a vicious bitch and she's protective of of her acolytes. And if you go to her with humility, she will protect you with great savagery and release you from your chains. Is she a goddess? Does she really exist? Or is it just in your unconscious? At a certain point, you have to say, what difference does it make? (laughs) I've grown up watching Bollywood movies where Carly features not all the time, but often enough. Yeah. Yeah. And when I grew up, I mean, obviously raised Muslim, but I loved Carly, man. She was, yeah. <laughs> I was a little, yeah. it was a, for a period of time, I was a bit obsessed. And the thing is, interestingly enough, she turned up everywhere. Like I, I worked for, there's a, a South, the, the first South Asian gay club in the UK was Club Carly. Oh. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I worked for them for seven years. In fact, so weird today, this morning, here's a synchronicity. This morning, yeah. uh, uh, the, the owner of the club messaged me just to randomly to see how, see how I was. I haven't heard from yeah. her in about three years. Well, that's not true. Maybe two years. Yeah. Who, who knows what Carly was doing for the, uh, for the victimized, potentially victimized case at that time. Who knows? <laughs> well, the, I mean, she's the, she's the deity for the hijra, uh, mm-hmm. for, the, for the neither male nor female or uh, transgender so yeah she's the she's the one that they they uh, they pray to i don't know if there might be another goddess as well but she yeah anyway it, it's a it's a goddess that i always felt quite connected to yeah so it's, it's interesting you raise the uh the transgender thing um most people don't know hermaphrodite is hermes with aphrodite so it's mm-hmm. a it's a magical combination of uh, a primal magician with the uh, goddess of love and he was a byproduct of, uh, I think it was, who did, she raped a beautiful boy and then called and he rebuked, he, he didn't want her. So she, re- she forced herself upon him and she said, gods, make him one with me forever. So they said, really, is that what you want? She said, yeah. So they just glued them together. So they became <laughs> one person. She was like, well, I'll be with you forever. So hermaphrodite was um, apparently... Uh, seen as both a blessing and a curse because in in uh, weddings people would give a got um, a little statuette of hermaphrodite to say oh a man and a woman has come together but it was a tongue-in-cheek joke it was like oh there'll be unity there'll be harmony and it's male and female energy coming together and the tongue-in-cheek joke was you won't be having much sex now there'll be no more sexual attraction because mm. hermaphrodite of course <laughs> Who's she going to have? Because she, she doesn't have sex. There's no sex mm-hmm. left. <laughs> I wonder if that's connected to the the Indian tradition where the uh, um, hijras uh, they 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 turn up to the weddings and offer their blessings. If a oh, baby is born, if a baby is born, yeah, they they also they turn up to give offer their blessings as well. 
That's interesting. Yeah, and they, and they they get money for it. They get given money for it. If they come to a wedding, they they usually dance. They get some, they get money for it. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I I've, I've always wondered, you know, when you read like um, some of what Jesus said, some of what Buddha said, Buddha with his twelve disciples, and uh, you, I, I do wonder how much trading of information or or communication or transport there would have been between India, the the, the full Indian Empire, and uh, Greece, the Mediterranean. And, and, well, I've and even then. I've even thought about how the Indian gods may be one. One may be connected to Krishna. Krishna may be connected to, uh, um, let's say, God, I can't think now. It wouldn't be Hercules, but like a Roman or Greek god. Uh, yeah. they, they could be the, the equivalents even there. Yes, um, there could be. The, 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 the definitely could be. I think there, there'll be books written. For example, sure. Durga, the, the goddess Durga, would probably be Aphrodite. Right. Right. Yeah, the, the, the probably, there's probably stuff out there, but I'd love to know more about this. It's very interesting uh, to have this. So that's a, a, what I read was it was a Roman and Greek tradition to give the goddess Aphrodite. And you're saying, uh, what, what, what are they called in Indian culture? Hydra. The, the, Hydra. Um, yeah, the, the, one, the transgenders. transgenders. Tran- transgender people actually show up and, and bless the wedding. Yeah, yeah. They'll dance at the wedding. They'll dance they'll at the wedding, dance wedding. and then yeah. they'll get given money for it. But it's good luck if they come at the wedding, and and also when, when babies are born. Uh, it can't can't be a coincidence. There must be some historical. There must be some historical link uh, uh, between the two. But I always remember reading the uh, the the first time I read through the pro- uh, the prophet the Pharaoh Akhenaten's writings, famous sayings, and I'm like, this sounds so similar to Buddhism. I can't believe this guy didn't read a few Buddhist texts. It's like, it's almost like, uh, it's almost like it's lifted from Buddhism. Anyway, what were we talking about? Gods and goddesses. Yes. Um, where were we? Okay. Well, I'll have to go back a bit now. Um, so how have the monotheistic religions inspired you? Because I hear you talking about Islam and I hear you talk about Jesus as well sometimes. So how have mm. they inspired you and how, how have they impacted you in your life? Um, I, I am in, intrinsically, uh, I have to be honest with you, I, I don't want to say, I could sound like a white nationalist now. I'm resentful of the de facto imposition of this, these, what I see as invading religions in England and the north of Europe. I'm like, why the fuck should I care about a mystical Jewish Palestinian who was the carpenter's son and came back to life. This is not, this is, these are gods of the desert. These are gods of the Middle East. And um, so I've always resented that. It got worse when I found out in my teens that the churches of England, uh, a good number of them are built on old Mithras sites. So they'd find the Mithras traditional churches, <laughs> smash them down and build a Christian church on top of it. Be like, yeah, you can still come and worship. It's very similar, <laughs> but it's a different God that you will now feed your energy into. So resentment first. The, uh, one of the things with Christianity, uh, J- Judaism to a degree, and Islam, where I see it having been forced on people, I, I, I resent it. I resent it. And Islam and Christianity did a great job. Did a great job for centuries when it came to the imposition of a culture, the imposition of civilization, the imposition of tax, uh, new economic or economic and cultural rules. I mean, Christianity and Islam did a did a damn good job, but I it makes me sad. It makes me sad. And in every country where I see Islam, and every country where I see Christianity imposed, I'm always like, what was the original? What what was the what was the original religion here? And which versions of Islam and Christianity mm-hmm. did it go through? It's always fascinating to know, uh, you know, find out about the Bogomils, the Gnostics. Bosnia is an interesting one where, uh, you know, they were trying to bully them into Islam on one side. And on the other side, the Catholics were trying to bully them. <laughs> and the, for a while, the, the, the Bosnians would just agree. Whoever showed up and said, do as you're told or we'll kill you. Were you a Catholic? They go, yes, we're Catholics. Then the Muslims would show go, are you Muslim? They go, yes, yes, we're Muslim. <laughs> but they actually had their own religion, sort of Christian Gnosticism. Um, it's ill-defined. It's sort of like uh, Bo- the Bogomils, but they just called themselves good Bosnians. So there was an original religion in Bosnia 
sort of Christian, sort of Gnostic. We're just good Bosnians. And I'm like, yeah. that's, that's the right way. So, uh, but what, where does it affect? It is a part of my psychology. I accept that. I had my, my, my experience in Malaysia. So the Islamic tradition is now interwoven. It will never now be undone. It's part of my history forever as a, as a person, my personal development. Um, and I, I found things as I've grown up that I love very, very deeply about both religions that I wouldn't give up now. I, 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 I couldn't give them up. It would be dishonest of me to give them up. It would be as dishonest of me to give them up as it would for me to say, I am now a Christian or I am now a Muslim. That, that's not an option for me. But there are elements of Islam I'll, uh, and Christianity I'll never, I'll never live without, I don't think, in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it, it's made a positive impact in your life. It, well, Islam never affected me negatively. Uh, so there's never been a, personally a negative, a negative influence. Um, I'm trying to think if experientially it did. No. The, and, the, and the parts that are a part of me have, have been positive. Christianity had a negative impact on me. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. I won't, like, everybody knows like how, how it can go. Um, Catholics versus Protestants and, and all of that silly horse shit. Um, but yeah, both, both now they're in, they're in my life. They're part of the way I see things and uh, I, I would be very sad to lose them. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next thing, well, again, straight on from that is uh what about corruption and dirtying the waters in these religions? And uh, well, we've kind of already t discussed that. Let's, let's get to your moral philosophy that I hear you talking about all the time. Um, what is your moral philosophy and how does it relate to the, uh, the religions or spirituality or the esoteric? Um, yeah. So let's put that into context. Um, me banging on about moral philosophy is because I have a job, which is, to help uh, codependents recover from narcissistically abusive relationships and to redefine their own boundaries and to help them overcome codependency and to protect them from narcissistic abusive, narcissistically abusive relationships in the future. It's also to heal fractures in the um, internal boundaries, which I've, I've tried to explain. It's not particularly easy to explain. It comes back to executive function that I mentioned earlier and building a healthy relationship with one's own superego. Um, so the extent to which I bang on about it to my followers is the extent to which it is a pill or a medicine to help them with their specific illness. It's not something that I spend a particularly big part of my life thinking about, to be quite honest with you, because I, I don't, I'm not struggling with overcoming a narcissistic abuse relationship. I don't find myself getting ripped off or, so a lot of these things were already done for me. They were a part of my past though. They were a very important part of my past. Oh, so the moral philosophy that you're talking about is more like a creation of a set of boundaries to protect oneself if they have CPTSD or, or whatever, yeah, their codependence. Mor yeah, mor moral, okay. philosophy, moral philosophy here is, um, uh, is me saying you don't have something and you need it. So it's for people who have no self. Forget that they don't have a moral philosophy. They have no fucking sense of self because it was abused out of them. It smashed out of them. So how can they even develop a sense of self without building something of a perimeter? So if you imagine a battle-worn nation with a very small army that's very weak with ship weapons, I have to be like, look, if you want to survive and you want to rebuild this nation, you better get to the wall right now and start rebuilding the fucker because the enemy will return and you're not in a position to fuck it, you're gonna get overrun. So people are like, oh, I don't wanna do it. I don't, and I'm like, you must know the difference between right and wrong because it's not even that the enemy is stronger than you. It's that the enemy is so cunning that they come as a friend and you're not seeing them because the intuition is switched off. Mm -hmm. So they go, oh, this person seems nice. They invite them in and this fucker's poisoning everybody's food and you know, <laughs> slitting their throats in their sleep. I went all Game of Thrones there for a second. Um, so that, that's, that's why it's important. It's, uh, it's, it's almost, it's about defense, protection, and critical thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in terms, of, in terms of a philosophy that you live by, maybe not in that context, but in context of um, your own personal way of living life, do you have uh, like a personal mission statement or, or something akin to that? 
Yeah, I, th I think so. I think so. I mean, I, to me, like a moral philosophy, a value system philosophy, a way of life is an ongoing process for me. And it's like doing weights. You've got to do it for the rest of your life because your body doesn't want to be muscly and your body doesn't want to do the work. So it's just forever more. So I lift, I pick the weights up every day. They're old friends. And I'll be like, okay, what do I think today? Like my thought this morning is a regular daily practice because uh, I'm a different person today when I wake up than I was yesterday. So the thoughts about the poppies that became the synchronicity mm -hmm. of electric dreams is because I'm waking my brain up with, okay, what do you think the nature of reality is today? And I do that inside of 20 minutes of waking up because that's a personal discipline for me. What is good? What is evil? What is the nature of this reality? How should a person live their lives? Um, so my, my moral philosophy about how people live their lives is rooted in the quote from the Gospel of Thomas, uh, which is an apocryphal gospel, a, a very strange gospel of Jesus, in which Jesus said, that which is within you, if it is brought out of you, that which is within you will save you. That which is within you, if it remains inside of you, it will destroy you. So what this means is you have an imperative to be the person you were born to be. If you do not, your potential doesn't just lie dormant, it rots. It rots. So light a fire under your ass and start living in accordance with your potential and who you're supposed to be. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. That's that's done something to me. Good. I <laughs> was supposed to. I told you I was going to give you something better. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, okay. It might sound like a nitpicky question. Is there a difference between... Do you? Okay, it. good. So what's the difference between... You, you use the word practice, your, your morning practice that you did, or mm -hmm. you also use the term discipline, and we've previously used the term ritual. Is mm. there a difference between those, those three things in terms of what you just said about what you do when you wake up within the first 20 minutes? I think a ritual is you're doing something with the vague hope of a result. A practice and a discipline, um, when we eventually get you into the weight, uh, you'll realize that you need a, there's actually a, a philosophy to lifting weights. And after a while, you pick them up and lift them because they're there. You pick them up and lift them because it's a day that ends in a Y. You just keep lifting. You just keep. So there's, that's, that's, a, that's a practice to me. That's a discipline. It, because it's not fun. You know, I don't want to get, I'll just stay in bed and have a wank. But no, <laughs> the alarm goes off. It's fucking early. And I have to go outside for 45 minutes and walk around and take fresh air and put my mind together. Because I know that this reality is constructed to knock me off my intent and to knock me off balance. So the first thoughts of the day, I want them to be my thoughts and they need to be higher level thoughts. They need to be like, okay, what are we doing here? What's the fucking point? Because I know how quickly we can fall into indolence, depression, despair, anxiety. And uh, that's so practice and discipline in this sense is doing it for the sake of doing it. Ritual is you're doing it in hopes that something good or useful will come of it okay okay good got it so uh is self-help or the new age movement a religion no 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 god i wish that it was um the self-help movement the new age movement is uh is is not even a bubble on the surface of the water it's 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 nothing it's, there's just nothing there. There's, there's no content in the self-help and, and new age movement. Um, it simply doesn't demand enough of people and is merely a, a manifestation of consumer capitalism. If you, you buy the book and you get your, your dopamine hit from buying the book and then from telling your stupid friends, you know, oh, I bought, like the Eckhart Tolle thing, people tell, <laughs> like, he's not so big now, but people used to buy his book all the time in yeah, 2005, yeah. 2006. He's got a new one. He's got this one. He's got that. And I'm like, are you reading them? Yes. Are you practicing what he says? Yes. And they know you're fucking not. Have you, have so you read his books? Have you read them? Like yeah, the Power yeah. of Now or A New Earth. Have you read them? Yes. Yeah. I, I quite liked A New Earth, but I really didn't like The Power of Now at all. I don't know um, why. I, 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 sorry, I said I read his books plural. I think the only book I read cover to cover was One Day the Sun Will Die. The overwhelming majority of what I've consumed of Eckhart 
was his tapes because I used to be a taxi driver and I like blagged pirate versions of all of his tapes back in the day. Um, so that's, and now with YouTube, you can, you can listen. So I've only read one of his, one of his books, but no, it's, he's not a great writer. I mean, it's not, no, I agree. Not, I agree. He's not. not well, it's not well, it's not fun stuff. Well, um, the power of now was terribly written. That's the very first thing I said when my friend asked me, how, how yeah, was it's, it? It's, it's, a, it's a poorly written book. Yeah. It's a poorly written book. Yeah. Okay. So next question. Which is, which is what proves that the whole thing is a bluff. There's tons of poorly written books out there that people say are wonderful. Did you ever try reading 50 shades of gray? No, oh <laughs> I did not try and God. read that book. I didn't want to read that book. Take any page of that book at random. And I swear to you, you would think it was written by a 12 year old. It's just <laughs> awful. Absolutely unmitigated garbage and it was a huge best-selling you know it's wonderful make so that so what we can learn from this conversation is if you want to be rich make pornography for middle class middle-aged mothers they give them what they want that's why it was popular right Let's that's what, they, what, they, want. That's what yeah. they wanted yeah <laughs> okay so we've discussed law of attraction and synchronicity the next question after that was what do you think of Jung we've kind of hit on Jung already what do you think of Jung I, I used to hold him in utter contempt um, Partly because I have this oppositional defiance thing where if anybody else says some, everybody else says a thing is wonderful, I'm like, no, it's probably shit because it's popular. Um, actually, I think what, and when people were talking about him, I was like, oh my God, just please fuck off. Actually, there is a real depth to Jung. There's a real depth to Jung, but um, he was also a very vain, um, very vain, very self indulgent man who ended up running a cult. Um, but I think he was a, I think he was a good guy, I, I, trying to be a good guy. I think he was genuinely trying to be a good guy. Um, and I used to think it was all, well, I still think a lot of it is very self-indulgent and it's very obfuscatory. But who am I? You know, who the fuck am I to say that? And at the end of the day, I was a, a cocaine-snorting doorman for 10 years of my life comes into personal development and PTSD field. And I only care about being given things that help me deal with my own CPTSD or help my clients. And Jung is not, is not great for that. Jung is like the borders of philosophy and psychology. People go for Jung because he's cool. People go for Jung because he's, he's, they think he's accessible. He's actually not. I, I know that the, the overwhelming majority of people in the new age movement who Tip the cap to Jung. I've never really tried reading his stuff. It's hard. Have you ever tried reading Adler, by the way? Not directly. I've read books on Adler. Yeah, don't. Just read books on Adler. It is the only person who compares is Nietzsche. It's, they have this style. They're all German intellectuals in the same time. They have a sentence with five different points, with commas, leading... And I'm like... <laughs> Dude, it's, it's really tough. It, the proper intellectual guys, really, really smart, but fucking hard to read. So Jung recently, I've, I've given him another go and I'm like, no, there's, there's real insight here. There's real insight. But what was annoying me is people keep saying to me, what do you think of shadow work? What do you think of integrating the shadow? And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. None of you, none of you even know what that means. None of you, nobody's, nobody's really reading Jung and penetrating what he meant. Why? Because it's hard, but it's easy to say, to talk about it, to talk around it. So I think what I resented was people flexing on Jung, but actually I, I, I have a lot of respect for Jung. I think Jordan Peterson talks a lot about that as well, doesn't he? The, that the shadow. put me off as well. The fact that JP was going on about him, I was like, Bleh. <laughs> <laughs> J, I can, JP. I can see the value JP. of it. I can definitely see the value of it. For yeah. someone, for someone like me, I feel like I, I don't, I, I don't act. I'm not comfortable with my darker side, so I try yeah. and stay in the, the lighter side of things. And I think I can take, completely see the value of needing to integrate with the darker aspects of my personality, so that if, if anybody needs some shadow integration work, my friend, it's you. Yeah, <laughs> you can that's, tell. That's, can you? That's, yeah, well, it's, it's where the it's where the trauma it's where the trauma stuff is, and. Um, I think there's a fear of trauma. There's a fear of darkness. There's probably, you maybe have violent, angry impulse and impulses inside of you. You abhor anger and violence. And so that gets negated. Um, and I, I, there's, there's a whole side of you that needs not to be negated. And it doesn't need to be, 
resolved because there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with the anger and the violence. There's nothing wrong with the anger. It's when it's, if you unleash it on innocence, that's wrong. <laughs> but the fact that it exists in you is, uh, is part of you. So there is, you know, the, 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 the splitting off is, is not such a good thing. The, the thing with JP was he stuck with, uh, Jordan Peterson stuck with the archetypes and he never went further than the archetypes. And I really feel like that's probably the least useful thing that Jung ever said was, <laughs> was about archetypes because beyond the sort of vague descriptions of gods and goddesses as morphogenetic fields, what are you supposed to do with an archetype, man? Well, how does it help you? What does it, does it help you put your socks on in the morning? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's very vague. Mm. Mm. Gosh, you got me thinking now. Yeah, I can, I can tell that was, that's, that's the idea. I'm I, just, I just didn't think to think that, is it even helpful? Yeah. It's just yeah. because what with my astrology, I mean, my, my, um, my astrology, I, you know, I've written, I spent nine years writing 144 individual archetypes. Yeah. Cause there's a, a, a so. Oh shit. That sort of, that sort of shit stuff on archetypes completely. and you've spent nine years working on them. Well, yeah. I mean, cause so I'm really into that sort of shit, aren't I? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, but I'm a dick. <laughs> no, 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 you're not, you're not. It's fine. I don't mind. I don't mind hearing your perspective. Um, but I'm really into archetypes. But the question, yeah. so the question that you've just raised here is, is it, is it useful? Uh, is it, what is its purpose? See, now the way I see it is if, you, if, if an archetype is different to, to mine, um, let's, so, so let's say I have my archetype, whatever it is. But if I know what, the, what this archetype is, th this is what I've done, with some, you know, I used to do this with acting things. I used to know what, what an oxleo is or what, what, what this is. Um, and then I would sort of step into that role to play that character. So in terms of if something requires me to be more assertive and I can say, okay, well, an Ox Leo is quite, Barack Obama's a chart, Barack Obama's chart, Ox Leo. Let me step into Barack Obama for a second. And, and, uh, and uh, or, or the dictatorial chart, which is Ox Taurus. If I step into the Ox Taurus, let me be Hitler for a second. You know? And, I'd love uh, to see that. <laughs> I'd love to see Zach as Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an example, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah, just yeah, sort yeah. of aspect, they stand into, step into those aspects of another yeah. person's personality. So, yes. it can, and I used to do that more when I was younger, when I was sort of acting pr properly, uh, even just in my personal life, if I needed to be more assertive, I would sort of do that. It took a lot of energy, but I could do it. So in that context- I, I, would, I, would, like to see you, I would like to see you do two things with acting. One is actually return to acting and be an actor and in your personal life, not act at all. Stop it, stop acting. Because I, I would rather you were not acting assertive and just actually feeling your own value to authentically say, hey, fuck face, don't fucking step on my foot or I'm gonna break something. <laughs> you know? that's, that's what I'd like to see more of. That's where I think there's, the, 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 there's a suppression of anger and violence there, where if it's expressed um, in, a, in, a, in a healthy way, in a healthy boundaried way, would be better and would put you in a more powerful position. You probably have a lot more power than, than you realize, I think. I mean, you're absolutely right, but I, I'm also aware of why, the, why I've suppressed all this, this anger. There's a hell of a lot of unexpressed anger within, mm -hmm. for sure. In my family, I was the one person who wasn't allowed to express anger. I was the mm -hmm. only person in the family that wasn't allowed to express any anger because mm -hmm. um, my p parent needed me to be that, be the person she could control. Well, there you mm -hmm. go, mother. My mother needed me to be the person who she could control. Mm -hmm. uh, and because and, she couldn't control the others. So therefore, if I ever expressed any anger or if I sort of it was over the top, mm. then it would, it would mean a complete, in the family dynamic, would just completely explode. It would erupt. Yeah. So one person had to be the person that where all the shit ended. And I was that person. And I wasn't allowed to say anything about it. And if I did, I got punished even more. Mm. So I, that's what's caused it. And I'm aware of that. But how does one... How does one deal with that? How does one release it? Do the punching pillows? I mean, is that really something that works? I don't know. I've never done it. Never tried it. There's, there's one question um, that it behooves you to wrestle with for the next few months, and that's, that's that. There's a whole, people will tell you in the comments, there's books written about what you're, you're describing, being the, the person, you're a, you're, you are a parentified, parentified child. child. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that, that needs to be uh, resolved. 
um, a lifetime then of putting other people's needs first, which builds even more resentment and anger is, is there. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot that would need to be unpacked uh, mm. there. But this, I th I'd rather than me give you solutions, I always think it's, it's just nice to have the question and just wrestle with it and go, okay, this is something I need to ask. This is something I need to, to figure out. I was forced into this role. What does that do to me today? Mm -hmm. How do I, I don't have the software to just say to somebody, hey, dickhead, don't do that. Wow, that's, that puts you in a vulnerable position. And then from, I, I've been through the same thing. I was a parentified child. I was, I was forced into that role of mediator and peacekeeper. And it just breeds the most dreadful codependency, especially, especially in intimate relationships, which is why all my intimate relationships have been a fucking circus. So these are things that can be resolved. And if they're resolved, they give us a power that, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't even imagine before. Mm -hmm. well, that's why I think the CPT, you. sorry? What? Great power awaits you. Oh, great. I look forward to that. <laughs> But I was going to say that the, uh, this is what the CPTSD work, but the um, Pete Walker's book has been a game changer for me. And I only, I only read it uh, recently, a few months ago, the first one, uh, Christmas mm. time, I think it was. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's just been such a, such a game changer. Yeah. yeah Finally, uh, I see clearly the territory. Now that I can see the territory, then I can really do something about it. Prior to that, I was looking, and I, I was looking at the wrong map. So how can I sort something out? How can I fix it? How can I resolve it? This is where I think, uh, this is how this ties back into magic and religion and the Egyptian religion and the esoteric. These were schools that were initiatory and it would probably be one master, one student. It wouldn't be one master, 40 students. That's capitalism. That's like, how do we maximize? They didn't give a fuck about money. Mm -hmm. So your initiation process before magic would be, would have, it must have been, I can't see how it wouldn't have been resolving childhood trauma. They must have had a way of discussing this, of talking about this and dealing with it. We don't seem to have any records of that. We don't seem to have any obvious history of how that was done, but it must have been done. It must have been done because everybody comes with, we have little hints. Uh, Jesus mentions breaking, sorry. Can you hear that? Yeah. What is it? Oh, it's uh, the, there's, there's health angels gathering outside my house. <laughs> it's another really weird synchronicity because I did a podcast over there by the kitchen table and I mentioned hell's angels uh, like five weeks ago on a different podcast. And then they started showing up. They come here and they sit and they take photos of the sunset. They do very on hell's angels -y stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about before it was interrupted by the bike? It seemed important. Uh, out mine too. So Wait. It's complete. It, was, it, was, it was mission critical. It was something that was mission critical. Oh, initiation and childhood trauma. Jesus pointed to it. He said, uh, only if you hate your mother and father can you follow me, which is probably a mistranslation. There must have been, how can anybody tolerate or, or get into deep mystical spiritual work, initiate, initiatory magic, which is, you know, Jesus' homie was John the Baptist, so they were initiating people into what was probably a mystery cult um, without doing the, the childhood trauma. You've got to resolve the issues with your mother and father that everybody has had since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to work on it, <laughs> and uh, I'll see how it goes. So um, what unifies religion, spirituality, and esotericism? What's at the core that we are searching for within these, these aspects, with these things? Um, they're, they're not unified. I think we can, we, can, we can confidently assert that unfortunately they're not unified. When they are, it's a wonderful thing because they all become the same thing. Uh, the Muslim, the Buddhist, the Christian, the Jew, the Hindu. When, we, when, the, when religion is spirituality, is, esoter is esotericism combined, everybody can sit together and not have any disagreements. Everybody who is actually living religion, living their spirituality, and living the esoteric, there's nothing to argue about. Nothing. Because at the core, just a general reverence for life is what would be the most important thing, I would imagine. 
Yeah, and also if you're if you're a mystic and you're living in the moment, you're just not grumpy enough to argue. You just, <laughs> just you just go well, you know. Maybe I don't agree, but it sounds like a beautiful story. It sounds like a beautiful metaphor. The Shiva and this Kali. That sounds fucking awesome. What do, do you know? They what? Do? That's all that um, uh, Eckhart Tolle needed to write. That first <laughs> sentence that you just said. <laughs> You're a grumpy mystic. Yeah. All, all you need to do is. Uh, what did you say again? I don't even know what I said. Oh, bored. <laughs> My God. It's Listen, a good thing we're recording it. We could play it back. Sometimes yeah, no, I say something. For oh. me, my, my, I've been doing this detox. And since I've been doing this detox, my mind just isn't working properly. I, just, I quit today. I lasted three whole days. I will quit today. And I just, I'm just not on but top have you, form. Have you, have you eaten properly today? No. Why? <laughs> because, because since doing this detox, I, I was trying to do keto at the same time, which was not smart. And uh, I'm still doing keto. I'm still doing keto. You, you, you seem like you've had a lot of coffee. Have I? No, I haven't. I haven't had any caffeine at all. Yeah. Look, have you ever done keto before? Yeah. Okay. So are you familiar but with the not, adrenaline? Not, with a, not whilst doing this detox. This detox was hardcore, man. Hardcore. It just messed are me you, up. Are you, are you fasting at the same time? Are you on yeah. an intermittent? Okay. Have you eaten yet today? I had to. I, when okay. I sort of stopped doing the, the this morning, I, I tried to do the detox continually, but then yeah. I, I just sort of stopped and I had to have something. So I have eaten this morning. Um, you, it's, it's adrenaline. You're hyper adrenalized. Your body is just releasing a shit ton of adrenaline to, to oh, deal yeah, with the, the stress you're putting it through. Um, what is it you're trying to get done physically? Cleanse my system and yeah. a bit of weight loss generally. And just general, yeah. generic health because... For me, when I am on keto, when I'm just doing keto, I find I think more clearly. Mm -hmm. Bread seems to be some evil creature that I, I can't live without. But when I do have, I just don't function well on it. It, it messes with my head. I become like a potato. Bread turns, <laughs> bread turns me into a potato. There's a quote. Bread turns me into a potato. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would say with, with all that stuff, uh, it, you've got to be patient, consistent, and when you put your foot down on the pedal, put it down slowly, slowly. It, it takes ages. And, you know, like you're the similar, you're a couple of years younger than me. Like this, if you tried this when you were 20, the, the weight would just fall off you. Past a certain age, you're looking at like three months, six months. It's, it's going to be so much slower than you want it to be. But you just have to laugh and accept it. That's what I do. Just go, That's ah, okay. Fine. It's all right. I don't mind. I can deal with it. I'm going to get, it's, it was stupid of me to do the two things together. I should have just done one thing. Sounds wild, man. Sounds yeah. completely wild, man. It's hardcore. <laughs> it's hardcore. And I, I, I do these things. It's, it's like I do everything in one go rather than uh, bit by bit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to prepare for another podcast soon. So maybe we could do one more question and then I'll, I'll bounce. Well, I've, I've, I've finished off everything except for the okay. very last question is, is how do these things relate to the world today? We need more I mean, of it, man. I mean, actually today, like, like with the things that have been happening recently, the protests, the, uh, the riots that have been happening, Democrats yeah. are now fascistic. I mean, secret controllers of the world. Specifically, what I wanted to talk, come back to was the, um, the lament of Hermes, because I thought yeah. that was really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. So when, when, I was, when I read through it, I, I just thought it was very, very relevant. So I, I mentioned the part of it before, I read the part of it before, that there will come a time when it will have been in vain that Egyptians have honoured the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. I'm not reading the next section, I'll come back to this bit. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. No one will raise his eyes to heaven. The pious will be deemed insane, the impious wise, the madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked will be esteemed as good. No word of reverence or piety, no utterance worthy of heaven will be heard or believed. And so the gods will depart from mankind, a grievous thing. And only evil angels will remain who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and robberies and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. We're there. Good now. times, baby. Good times. We're, we're there. And this is, uh, this is the lament of Hermes from goodness knows how many years, how many years back. This is this is why the world the world needs more people like you to who are human, who can be vulnerable, who can admit their flaws, who are not dogmatic and preachy, who can lead people into 
uh, the, the this reverence, this piety, this practice that that's mentioned in in uh, the prophecy of Thoth. Um, I think I think you're just going to have to accept that that's your mission. It's going to be a right pain in the ass, but oh well. Uh, okay, I accept it. I accept it, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very very much for your time. And, no problem. Um, and for your humor and your heart and for everything that you do. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this was helpful for everybody that listens in. And uh, I hope you will join me again for the Zachariah Ideal podcast next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.